Dr. Park, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you so much for inviting me. Now, what has North Korea actually been up to during this pandemic? Uh, you know, North Korea, the regime has said um, for the past several months that it had zero infections, uh, much less deaths, um, whereas uh, everywhere, else, uh, everywhere else in the world has been uh, suffering from uh, these infections and deaths. Um, but the regime has said it had zero until recently, in which it said that it claimed that a uh, North Korean redefected into the country and infected the country and that there might now be uh, an infectious uh, outbreak uh, in North Korea. And so this is a strange take um, after you know nearly si six months of denying that it had any cases that it now claims that this uh, person has uh, swam into to claim that the somebody has gone back into North Korea and that as a result has infected uh, some uh, North Koreans there. Why now? Because to tell you the truth, none of us really have any idea of how true this is. We don't know whether there really were no infections. There's no way of verifying. I mean, the fact that they made a statement at all is interesting that they could, you know, they could have just put this under the rug and just denied anything um, just and just gone along with their existing narrative of zero infections. But the fact that the regime made it so public, it makes me think that um, that the regime is trying to say that this is South Korea's fault, um, that because South Korea has the, the virus um, and that it was unable to contain it, that this person has infected North Koreans, that this could be a way for the regime to try to extort um, aid or funding from South Korea to say, this is your fault. The second thing is that it might be, at, the situation might be at, at, a, uh, at a level where uh, the regime um, can't contain or maintain that narrative anymore um, and that it needs to blame somebody. Um, and so uh, it could be one or both of those reasons, as well as a slew of other reasons that are unknown to us. But it seems to me that at a minimum, North Korea is trying to deflect blame away from the regime and from North Korea itself, um, if there is an outbreak in North Korea. I think that what this does is that it deflects blame away from anything that the regime has done um, to say this is somebody else's fault. I mean, this is a, a pretty consistent Thing that North Korea does to make sure that the regime doesn't get blamed for um, any bad uh, incident. Do you think this is a ploy also to try and ask for an easing of UN sanctions? I think that is uh, definitely one, possibly one of the uh, motivators for North Korea coming out in the way they did about this infection case. Um, and this could be a ramp toward uh, accepting aid, um, and or trying to extract more aid um, and to try to create a situation where it makes it more feasible uh, for the regime to accept aid from the US, which, is, which, the, which Washington has offered, as well as to accept uh, South Korean aid, um, but to ramp it up even more by saying, you did this, um, and so you need to, uh, to cough up some additional funds to make sure that nothing, uh, nothing goes awry in North Korea. I thought it was quite telling also that recently the United Nations Food Organization, FAO, pointed out that the food shortages in North Korea, which have always existed, are even more acute in recent times. Is this some kind of indication that North Korea is going through a bit of a crisis, that there is an, a destabilizing that's taking place that they've hidden so far? Yeah, there is no question that North Korea is, has, suffers from a variety of economic maladies. Um, so on the one hand, we have the sanctions that are imposed on North Korea's uh, exports, um, such as coal, iron, fish, and textiles. But we also have the border lockdowns uh, with China, which has really cut off a lot the lifeblood of the North Korean economy. China, after all, um, accounts for over 90% of North Korea's total trade. And the shutting down and the lockdown because of the coronavirus has really exacerbated the situation uh, in North Korea and the and the food situation as well. Um, that's always that's been a um, that's always been a problem over the years, um, and it's a problem of North Korea's mismanagement um, and its uh, and its inability to pr produce enough food for itself as the regime diverts funds away from that for its nuclear weapons program. So so I think this is uh, you know it, while Kim has been saying. Uh, in recent days and months, 
that uh, he's never going to give up his nuclear weapons deterrent, that he's going to bolster his weapons program, that that combined with this statement about uh, coronavirus possibly infecting uh, North Korea, that, uh, that this could be a way for Kim to start accepting aid or to demand aid. We've also seen that uh, some UN reports, although this may end up being disputed by China, uh, indicating that China may be on the sly actually taking coal from North Korea, in other words, breaking the sanctions. Beijing uh, doesn't like sanctions to begin with, uh, and, and the Chinese leader's preference is to use economic engagement and, and economic carrots to try to wean North Korea away from its nuclear weapons program. Um, and what we've seen, uh, according to various UN reports, um, to various uh, research institutions, that there is a lot of uh, sanctions bending uh, and, and absence of sanctions implementation or uh, Chinese authorities turning a blind eye to sanctions violations uh, happening in the past couple of years. Um, but I would also say that at the, at the government level, um, Beijing with Moscow um, have been pretty clear about what they want to do with sanctions. Um, they proposed in December of 2019 at the UN Security Council to lift some of the sanctions that are on North Korea to say that North Korea has refrained from a lot of provocative actions and therefore we should uh, lift some of these sanctions to encourage better behavior and to maintain uh, the this, uh, this stability um, in North Korea. Um, so I think that um, on the, at the government level, but also at the sub-government level, at the sub-national level, there is a lot of sanctions violations happening. Uh, and this is something that's been documented very nicely by, by the UN panel of experts. Do you agree though? Do you think it is time to lift some of the sanctions, that the sanctions have gone on too long and they actually haven't had the desired effect? So I think we have to be careful about what the point or in understanding what sanctions are all about. And sanctions are there to keep us safe. Um, and the, uh, much of the sanctions on North Korea have to deal with counter proliferation. Um, and that's to prevent um, sensitive technologies, nuclear and ballistic missile technologies from going into North Korea and out of North Korea to bad actors, uh, whether they're state or non-state actors. Um, and I would argue that the beginning of the end of those really uh, maximum pressure sanctions really started to erode as soon as President Trump in March 2018 said that he was willing to meet with Kim. Let me bring you back to just what you said. You said that the sanctions actually stopped working the moment President Trump agreed to have the summit with the leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. So two years ago, they met here in Singapore. And for what we can see, not much has come out of it, or perhaps you could say nothing has come out of it. So what was the point with all of these summits? We, uh, are you know, we so I think any when I say that um, the, the maximum pressure that, the, that was the policy of the Trump administration has been eroding um, since March of 2018. Uh, President Trump has been clear um, that he, he has held back um, sanctions designations on North Korean and Chinese entities um, who are violating these sanctions. Um, he doesn't want to talk about maximum pressure anymore. Um, he has turned a blind eye to some of these shorter range ballistic missile tests and other provocative actions um, to preserve the mood of diplomacy. So, um, so if the US president is not interested in maximum pressure, then there's very little reason for um, our allies and partners um, to have that same kind of fervor and same kind of enthusiasm um, as they did uh, potentially in 2017. So isn't it curious, in a way, isn't then President Trump uh, thinking in the same way that China and Russia think? 
and that is you have to be nice to Kim Jong-un. He's repeatedly said that he admires Kim Jong-un, that he's honest and he's sincere and that they have a good relationship. Uh, and the president um, has, uh, you know, right after Singapore summit, um, he, he, he tweeted out that, uh, North Korea, that North Korea threat is no longer. Um, even after just that one meeting with a very lukewarm kind of uh, vague statement um, uh, in terms of North Korea saying that um, it was w willing to work toward denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So I think that um, the president, um, I think put him in a, in a way put himself in a bad situation where because he has already declared victory on North Korean denuclearization, the fact that he has uh, focused on the absence of nuclear testing um, as, as well as a, a longer range ballistic missile testing as the marker of his success, that it puts him in the corner in terms of what Kim can do and say to, uh, to explode, so to speak, um, Trump's claims about success. Um, and so I think that um, right now we're in a situation that is worse than status quo summits um, in that Kim is now probably much more emboldened um, with the US president on his side, who's willing to bat away human rights violations, who's willing to look the other way on uh, other missile uh, testing, willing to look away on the belligerent language and hostile rhetoric and threats against South Korea. Um, so what, what kind of message does that send to Kim Jong-un? Um, and I think it's a bad message and a bad lesson for a young dictator with nuclear weapons to be burning. So do you think that Kim Jong-un is a modern dictator, if you can call him that? Or is he really still the old-fashioned dictator who uses murder, rape, torture camps, uh, just like any dictator does? Kim Jong-un wants to be this modern leader of a nuclear-armed North Korea. Um, and he has packaged North Korea in that way in the, in the water parks, the condominiums, the fashions, the luxury department stores and skate parks and all of these wonderful accoutrements of modern um, prosperous um, society. But on the other hand, um, I argue in the book that he is constrained by what he inherited. Um, he inherited the nuclear weapons program. So it's really difficult for him to give that away, um, especially because it's so baked in the DNA of the regime. Um, moreover, Kim has really uh, branded himself as a nuclear dictator. Um, all of these photos of Kim uh, uh, overseeing the ballistic missile test. Um, and so, you know, Kim has made it so much a part of his brand, um, but he also needs the repression that he inherited from his grandfather and, and father um, to, to sustain the regime and to sustain himself. Um, and so there's very little that he can do. Um, he's, uh, he's, he is in, in a box of sorts that uh, he is unable to give up the nuclear weapons program. I think what Singapore and the Hanoi summits have shown is that he has very little creativity in terms of um, what he might give up to get something. Um, and so uh, that puts us in a really difficult situation where we still have a relatively young leader. Now he uh, has almost 10 years of experience. Uh, but that he is more he is more doubled down and really embedded into North Korea as a nuclear weapons program. Kim Jong-nam, his elder brother, was assassinated in an incredibly bold and rather, rather brazen and nasty way in Kuala Lumpur uh, at the international airport. The killing of the relatives, I think, I mean, that really showed us uh, his boldness and his aggressiveness. Um, 
is much more uh, intense under this, uh, under Kim 3.0. Um, in the past, the uh, North Korean dictators used to, um, you know, shuttle off, uh, you know, troublesome family members, or they would demote them or just disappear them, but they would reappear after a certain period. And the gruesome way in that the uncle was killed, I think, was really just shocking to so many people who have been watching North Korea for a long time. On the, on the half brother, the fact that Kim, you, the Kim regime, used a, a chemical nerve weapon in an international public setting in full view of cameras. I mean, where exactly. are there more cameras than in an airport? Um, I think that was not just to send a message to the people um, within North Korea, the elite, that he was willing to uh, go to such lengths um, to get rid of very inconvenient relatives, but I think it was also a testing of, of the international community. What were we going to do that he was going, that the North Koreans were going to use this uh, this very dangerous chemical weapon uh, in an international public setting. Yes, because isn't he telling everybody and particularly his own citizens that even if you are related to me, even if you are privileged, I can get you anywhere in the world. That's right. And it's not just the relatives either. Um, and it's that, you know, after uh, after they uh, he executed his uncle back in 2013, he started recalling a bunch of other diplomats from overseas. Um, and you really saw the network of how the, how the uncle was using his network and his connection and privileges to get jobs for his nephews, um, his, you know, his, his relatives, his you know, close cronies. It doesn't just send a message to the family members, it sends a message to anybody who aligns with people other than uh, Kim Jong-un himself. Um, and so it's it's much broader than just the relatives, but it goes to the heart of this patronage network system that exists in North Korea. That we're going to see an escalation of attacks. The, the liaison office, for example, was blown up. I would say that given uh, what we've seen in the past, um, when we see a U.S. presidential transition or an election, um, the North Korean regime has used uh, strategic provocations like a nuclear test or a rocket launch or a ballistic missile test to introduce um, the new president or to warn a new uh, incoming administration about, uh, about what North Korea intends to do um, and to tell everybody in the region and the US president that this is, this is the law of the land, North Korea's nuclear weapons, you just have to live with it and deal with it. Um, and so uh, if, if past is, is precedent, then, then we might uh, see some uh, increasingly provocative actions in the coming months. Um, of course, um, in, in December of 2019 as well, as we rang in the new year in 2020, uh, Kim Jong-un himself said that um, they're developing a, a new strategic weapon and that he, there would be a shocking action uh, against the United States. Um, and so all of those things are on the table. Um, so far, it's very vague, um, but uh, North Korea has been, even in its shorter range ballistic missile testing, are advancing the technologies that would um, that would improve their uh, the more strategic um, technologies or weapons programs. So I think that uh, we might see uh, some provocative actions in the coming months, especially as we move toward uh, the U.S. presidential election. But you've been giving informal advice to the Biden campaign. What have you been telling them about North Korea? I, you know, I, I'm a very informal volunteer. I don't speak for the campaign, um, but I'll give you, I'll share my views, um, which is that um, that we have tried leader to leader diplomacy. He continues to threaten South Korea. He continues to threaten regional stability um, and take and, and turning a blind eye to the human rights violations and to uh, the missile advancements um, has not really has not gotten us uh, very much. Um, and we're not very far into, um, I would say that we're, we're start, we have to dig our way back up to zero. And North Korea's weapons programs are faster, more reliable, more dangerous and more mobile 
Um, and so North Korea has been making progress on its weapons pro programs even during um, the two years of, of summitry. So if uh, we look at the maximum pressure sanctions, the Trump administration has said that it was because of the sanctions, it was because of the maximum pressure that Kim came to, Kim came to the table. Um, and so if that logic holds, um, then I think that we need to continue to build up leverage against Kim and to force him to, to make the choice that he can't have uh, both, you know, both uh, economic prosperity and regime survival and his nuclear weapons program, that it's got to be either or. When we look at East Asia, when we look at um, the East Asia, uh, Asia Pacific region, um, North Korea is continues to be that, uh, that, uh, that instigator of instability, a nuclear armed uh, North Korea under the control of an unpredictable, aggressive, bold, confident young leader who could be in power for 20, 30, 40 years. I think that is an untenable situation. Dr. Park, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you.